Welcome to another edition of the Opposing Points podcast. I'm really excited for the guest we have today, uh, Tony Kinnett, a founder and owner of Chalkboard Review, and also a contributor to various publications like National Review and The Federalist. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Tony. Thank you very much for having me, David. Cool. Um, so can we just start off giving a bit of a background on yourself? Um, what what Chalkboard Review is about? And uh, my, my most interesting question is, how have you not been fired yet? Oh, there's a lot there. So I'll, uh, I'll see if I can give the very briefest explanation for the Chalkboard Review. Uh, March of 2020, a friend of mine and I who'd written for various publications were chatting as many teachers that also do education policy often do. And uh, we were discussing how there were no publications at all that would print teacher op-eds um, regularly that were from a political ideology that wasn't very hyper-progressive. And so he convinced me to start this publication with him, the Chalkboard Review. And uh, it's been just, it's blown up ever since. We can't believe it. We're up to 17,000 monthly readers. Uh, we have a phenomenal team of 15 that work together to make sure that ideologies um, really from all over the political spectrum are promoted. And most importantly, that our audience gets to decide what is a good and bad article. Parents get to see what teachers think inside the education system. We're not telling parents, telling teachers what they can and can't write and see. As for a <clears throat> kind of a personal background, I am a science curriculum developer uh, for the Indianapolis public school system. I'm the science coordinator. They are not endorsing any of what I am saying here. And they are very, very intent on making sure that I know that because my personal ideology is about opposite that of the district. And probably by making that clear and probably by, uh, well, <laughs> as to the reason I haven't been fired yet, the HR team is a little apprehensive uh, to do anything about me because they know that as a conservative education policy journalist, it would be very silly for them to just ax me uh, when all of the media contacts that I have would, would be ready to call it out for the garbage that it is. And the other reason is I haven't really given them a solid reason to fire me. Um, yeah, I talk about a lot of the silly junk that they do, uh, but I don't release any private information or addresses or student information because, you know, I have a competent understanding of privacy law and I don't want to see individuals destroyed or disrupted. That, that has nothing to do with what I'm about. Awesome. And I'm curious, like, what, what made you speak up? Um, have you always thought this way? What was your, your moment that, um, that, that made you speak up? And does it have anything to do with maybe your upbringing? You know, most people don't have the courage. We have a lot of bystander effects going on. So I think that's a really interesting. So I was, uh, I, I grew up in you know, rural Indiana and I grew up in a pretty conservative household and I enjoyed politics from a young age. You know, I've always really enjoyed it. I went to college and, and really got away from it for a while though. Uh, near the end of my time getting my science education degree in my, in, for my bachelor's, I was advised by a couple of members of the faculty at Maranatha, which is a small college in Wisconsin that I attended that I should go intern for Governor Scott Walker's office in Wisconsin. And I kind of took it on a whim, thought, yeah, that'll be a fun way to spend a couple of days during the week. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I really can't explain it other than that I just got in there and I found out that I was, I was good at it. I really enjoyed it. And uh, most of all, uh, that it kind of became an avenue for me to express things that were very important to me and to learn a lot in a very short amount of time. So while I was there, I sat under the classes of uh, Gloria Ladson Billings, I was auditing things so I could learn about how the other side viewed education policy. And that ended up being very worthwhile for stuff I'm sure we'll talk about later regarding critical race theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say the turning point for me, when education, when I finally decided I was going to kind of speak up is a little different and on a personal level and on an organizational level. So speaking out against the general nonsense that pervades American education probably hit when I was in my graduate program. That's when I started writing for a publication called The Lone Conservative. Graduate programs for teachers are just garbage. They're awful. You don't learn anything. And anyone who tells you they learned a lot from their master's program either went to a small classical private school or they're lying. I Really, there's just nothing that they teach you. It's yeah. so silly. The things that I sat through, I had two professors at Ball State University who didn't show up to class for 10 weeks. 10 weeks. They didn't show up. I mean, there was just no class and I'm sitting here paying for this degree and I'm not even getting an education. Please. I did have a couple of good professors that taught me some functional things, 
most of it was just garbage. And all that upset me because, you know, I was getting told I was the problem in education because I was white, because I was male, because I was straight, because I came from a Christian culture, because, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all of the things that they like to pin everything on. And they had this weird, like almost sexual obsession with John Dewey. It's so strange. Like, oh, he believes that kids should be in charge of the classroom. He's so great. He's so wonderful. Isn't that so forward thinking? Yeah. Like, this is the guy who believes in like eugenics and like a host of other terrible things, but this education theory is fine. So that's when I decided to like personally start getting involved in politics. As to when I started turning my focus towards Indianapolis itself, it came in the last couple of weeks. So I had kind of a longstanding agreement with human resources and, and kind of my bosses at, in Indianapolis public schools that I wasn't going to talk about things that were going on inside Indianapolis while I worked there because I felt that while I was there, as long as you're treating me like everybody else, as long as I'm allowed to act like any other employee, I'm not going to break that stuff. Now, when I leave, I may say a few things like I do every other place that I leave. But while I'm here, I'm going to try my best to be the model employee. The problem was they weren't holding me to that standard that everyone else was. So we found out that there is a math interventionist for Longfellow Middle School, which is one of our schools at IPS, that says some very, very, very horrific racist things on her Twitter. She's got like 17,000 followers. And uh, the stuff that she says is vile. I mean, like that she doesn't want black kids and white kids hanging out at college. Um, and I am not exaggerating that at all in that tweet she's actually griping at parents for letting you know black children play with white children yeah uh, she's called all cuban and hispanic people white uh, she has called a black people that she doesn't like the the c word it's, it's used to kind of portray an uncle tom aspect insult mm -hmm. and she's just very just honestly a very horrible person i mean just god awful terrible person and uh i realized that hr had never called her into any meetings as they'd called me into two meetings over one tweet saying rest in peace, Rush Limbaugh, as well as um, another uh, time when I was interviewed by the Washington Free Beacon over my graduate program at Ball State. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird because there, there's a moment when you realize you're not playing on the same field as everyone else. I mean, as a conservative in the United States, you already know that from the media, you're not playing on the same field as the other side. Yeah. But then they bring you over into the professional environment and you think, okay, but these are real people down on the, on the, on the ground. And at least there's got to be a lot of people who might say, you know what, let's still treat everyone the same. There are a lot of people who really just don't want politics involved in their lives, and they just want to do what's best for people. So they're going to leave politics out of it. Well, I found out I wasn't being treated on the same rules. And it was at that moment when I realized you're treating me different because I'm a conservative. And then on top of that, you're actually asking principals to lie to parents and say, we're not teaching critical race theory here. When you then do a professional development a couple months later saying, hey, this is why we're teaching critical race theory, that, that was just too much. And so now I'm, I'm being very honest about what's going on in Indianapolis public schools. And if they fire me, then, well, there's a lot more that will be released to the public. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of good work you do. And, and there was that Rutgers, I think, professor that said some pretty egregious things that I saw yesterday um, uh, regarding, regarding race. I don't, know if, I don't know if you came across that. Um, but in, in the education system, I certainly, you know, I, I grew up leaning conservative, you could say, and I, I knew going into any essay that you do not put any other spin on this other than what the teacher says. And that was just kind of, if you say anything else, you might get a bad grade. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, just kind of, of common knowledge. And I don't think there are that many teachers in public schools that are of the conservative persuasion. Um, maybe, maybe they're afraid to speak up, but in my in my context, you know, I graduated high school in 2011, graduated college in 2015. Uh, most of my teachers were were outward, outwardly liberal, um, and, and would encourage, I guess, maybe not outwardly, but but sort of a peer pressure of of what your views are. Um, you know, I was sort of teased for for not necessarily uh, towing uh, the lines that that they want you to. Um, mm. so do you think that there's a reason why uh, you know do do conservatives shy away from teaching? Is there something else going on? Well, according to the last statistical data that we have, which was a study published in 2017, I actually don't think the majority of teachers are on the left. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise. In fact, it's most likely that there's about one third of teachers who consider themselves firmly on the left. That leaves two thirds that are going to be independents, apolitical, centrist, libertarian, conservative, or populist. Um, I think that the reason you see a lot of the leftist teachers speaking out are probably two reasons. 
number one, they control the institutions. So they hold all of the institutional seats of power. And then number two, like you said, they're, they're, they're quiet, they're afraid to speak out or often, more often than not, conservatives are likely to just be apolitical about things. I mean, look, you, you believe something different, cool. We'll go our own separate ways. We won't drag politics into this. And unfortunately, there's a time in our education system in which one side thinks that everything is political. I mean, Gloria Ladson Billings did just say teaching is in and of itself absolutely 100% political. And then you have other people that just want to go and teach. And that's kind of the conservative message in education right now. Just go teach kids, educate kids and call it a day. You don't need to tell them what to personally believe. So I think the reason that, you know, there's this perception that the entire the entirety of education is on the left is that those educators that are on the left are very loud. Um, I mean, you can make a movement look a lot bigger than it is just by being extraordinarily loud. But if you walk through some of the schools in the Midwest, you'll find that there are a large portion of teachers who are kind of independent, who are conservative, who are populist. And uh, more often than not, you'll find a lot of old kind of Rust Belt Democrats that are really disillusioned with a lot of the silliness on the left. They're not a huge fan of Republicans, but mm -hmm. they're definitely not a fan of the left. I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a fair I think there's fair amounts of reasoning to not be fond of, of either party at the, at this moment in this sure. monopoly that we have. Um, but yeah, yeah. Where I'm from uh, in Long Island, it's, it's basically probably leaning more towards that firm on the left stance. Um, just yep. part of the country you're in definitely matters. Yep. Interesting. Um, so I think one of the, one of the key things uh, going on right now is critical race theory. Um, there's a, a, a couple of laws that have been passed uh, banning it. Um, but I want to start with like what it is, where it came from, um, and and how it's gone into our schools. Because I think there's disagreements on what it is and whether it's even taught in schools. So critical race theory, kind of to put it in the easiest way to think about it, critical race theory is a lens with which you view history and which you view character and morality. So critical race theory, the, the core idea is that uh, the Western civilization has been a terrible oppressor of minority groups throughout history, that white people, which is what they're going to call Western civilization, invented all of the mechanical tools of oppression, and that every single thing that has befallen human history since 1619 um, or earlier, depending on which critical race theory scholar you're talking to, Every single thing that's gone wrong is, is white people's fault. And continually to this day, it's, it's systemic, meaning that if you are white, you are by nature receiving illicit gains. And if you are not white, then you are being oppressed by whiteness inherently from birth. <clears throat> so that's kind of what critical race theory is, just as a core idea. It's, it's a lens from which you view the world. And worldviews in education are very, very common. Uh, so this is so funny. We're, we're arguing about critical race theory right now. Like this is the first political argument we've had about banning curriculum in schools and banning pedagogy when we just got done with the evolutionism and creationism debate in the late 90s. And it was exactly the same. Uh, people wanted to ban a pedagogy, which was a worldview lens that Christ and that God and, and Christianity created the world in seven days or six days and he rested on the seventh. And that there's a pedagogy in that that's tied to curriculum. So we argued over teaching it in the class and like, whether you should present all sides to kids and how you should allow them to talk and whether stuff should be in the classroom, et cetera. Now here we are and we're talking about critical race theory. Only this lens paints kids in the classroom who do not agree with you as evil. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different scholars that founded critical race theory. We can talk about all those. We can talk about uh, the person I've mentioned already, Gloria Ladson Billings. You can talk about Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw. You can talk about Richard Delgado. Ibram Kendi was not maybe a founder, but he certainly contributed a lot of its intermediate uh, curriculum. Robin D'Angelo and, of course, Barbara Applebaum. A lot of this comes from some of the pro socialist communist style writings of uh, Herbert Marcuse. Yep. The long and short of critical race theory is that it exists to paint a certain cultural group as a victim to rationalize actions that are not individually appropriate. They're not individually moral. So I can't take something away from you for basically no reason at all. I can't say take $20 from you. But if I apply the aspects of critical race theory, I have a very substantial amount of Native American ancestry. You don't. And because you don't, because you are phonetically white, you owe me $20 because of the suffering that I must have had. I can't be racist because people have been racist towards my demographic 
And they're all of these kind of little sticky situations that, that critical race theory has seeped into that have, have ruined a lot of schools, have ruined a lot of classrooms, and quite frankly, are ruining a lot of lives. They're corrupting children and teaching them that color matters and not character. So that's kind of how critical race theory boils down. That's, that's really interesting. And, and I, I think you mentioned socialism. I think a lot of people that probably hear the idea of, of you know, let's teach kids about race and privilege. I don't think they're uh, knowledgeable or aware of its Marxist roots. Um, and that's, it's honestly, that's the biggest thing. And that's kind of where the rubber met the road for me. People think, so there's a huge difference between teaching the things that this country has done wrong and teaching about race and the racism that occurred in this country and every other country and every other civilization on planet earth yeah. and teaching critical race theory. Very, very two hugely different things. Teaching about regular history and what happened and that we as a society have done things to make up for and enshrine the individual rights of each individual, regardless of gender or color, is a very worthwhile lesson to teach children. But there is, as you said, a very Marxist origin in critical race theory. I didn't used to believe that. I just thought it was like race baiting um, and, mm -hmm. and just kind of racial castigating. And then I sat through the Racial Equity Institute's uh, training session that Indianapolis made me sit through. And within the first 15 minutes, they were talking about how they didn't really want to use the terms white privilege because it was unkind to the oppressed poor white people under the corporate jackboot in like West Virginia. And I was like, oh my word, this is very straight Marxist garbage. Mm -hmm. And it was. That's why capitalism is such a punching bag for them. And it's only instead of the bat being oppression of the workers, it's a racial bat and it's oppression of minorities. Yes. Um, and, and also, I think there's some context with, uh, with, with Mao's cultural revolution, this whole, Absolutely. This whole political correctness. Um, uh, I, I read uh, Michael Knowles' book, uh, Speechless, and he goes through a history of this that was unbelievable to me. Like, I, I was not aware of any of the origins of this stuff um, and, and sort of how the, how the left can, can manipulate language when the right typically is all about free speech. Um, and, and that's progressed from there. Can you talk a little bit about that historical context? And if it oh, absolutely from there, it's, it's wild. People don't know the history of how Mao came to power a second time in China. No one has any idea that Mao actually had to come back because communism wasn't quite working. His great leap forward was a failure. Yeah. And so he had to encourage all of the youth to get rid of the four olds, right? So that's customs, culture, uh, habits, and ideas. I had, had the list right here just to make sure that I, I said it right. <laughs> And he encouraged all of these students basically to work together and kill off anything that was old and anything that disagreed with their ideology because it was evil, because it was dangerous. And the idea was that they would enter this academic utopia on the other side because they were young, they had these great ideals and they weren't gonna be shackled by all of the horrible horrors of the past. And so you basically had an incorporation of fascism into China. And one of the most amazing things that, that, that appeared to me out of the, the Maoist cultural revolution is that they literally are doing what Antifa is doing now. So they walked around calling anyone who disagreed with them, they called them fascists. They called them uh, other horrible, horrible names, accused them of all of these horrible historical crimes, and then stripped absolutely everything of value away from them. Any semblance of rights they might have had, any kind of capital, any kind of property, they ripped it away from them. They ripped families apart. They justified rape. They did all kinds of horrible, horrible, horrible things in the quest to get rid of those four old things that provided any semblance of historical China. Well, what are we trying to do today? We're trying to get rid of old American culture, old American ideals, trying to get rid of, of leaders in the past that are standing atop statues. And I'm not talking about glorifying bad things that they've done, but there is more to Thomas Jefferson than the fact that he owned slaves. And if you're boiling everything that he down, hid down to owning slaves, well, then I would like you to publish your entire browser history on the web now, since we're going to judge every single individual by every sin. And no, I'm not excusing any one of their individual sins, period. I'm not. I'm not equating looking at pornography with slavery. What I am suggesting, though, is that if we're going to hold people in the past to our standards of today, then that is probably one of the most silly and dense ideas possible. But we've already seen it in practice. And Maoist cultural revolution took old ideas held them to this brand new warped set of standards. And it creates a very strange, very weird mirror with which we look at in history where we're seeing the same things happen today. 
And a lot of people say, oh, no, that, that's not happening. That's just a conspiracy theory. We're actually doing something just. What, you don't want to tear down slave owners? What, you don't want to tear apart really terrible things? And of course, uh, by giving it you know, fancy, fuzzy words like restorative justice, it, it sounds great, but it, it's not. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting that the, the revolution in, in, in China was, was not really race-based at all. It was more class-based. And I think one could make the argument that we do have more of a class-based division here in terms of like wealth inequality. And I think people are finding their anger, uh, especially, you know, as, as the wealth gap, as they view it as uh, separating the rich and the poor, maybe uh, surfacing some anger and they're, and they're really grasping at this must be because we're this color and they're, th they're X color. I think that would be true if a lot of the individuals in this country were actually poor who are advocating against this. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't actually see that. What I see and, and what the data shows is that it's a lot of middle class individuals and upper middle class individuals who are bored. So we see this in elementary schools. Yeah. Uh, elementary teachers are, uh, by and large, some of the loudest in the education system, mm -hmm. uh, as are high school English teachers. And curricularly, they have uh, some between the two of them, they have the least amount of rigor in their work in modern curricular and pedagogical settings. And so they're bored. They get home. They don't really they're not a part of the community. They're not a part of any family structure. They're not a part of any religious organization. They're not a part of any club, any activity to devote their time. So they need something to do because they're fed, they're watered, they're entertained and they're bored. Mm -hmm. So they need a political something to make their existence feel worthwhile. Like and a, so that's one of the reasons that this is so attractive to people is because it gives them something to do. They're bored. So they have like a, a, a savior complex, you think? Oh, the savior complex is super evident. I mean, look at how white elementary teachers talk about their black children. It's absolutely disgusting. Uh, there is an administrator at the Indianapolis public school system that once talked about uh, how he disciplines his black son differently. And he has to stop and think, am I disciplining my son because I love him? And because what he did was wrong and he needs to know that, or am I disciplining him because he's black? And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. like what? And it's a savior complex because all of the white women in that call immediately started going, oh, you're so brave. That's so wonderful. That's so you're, and it's, it's worship. And I'm, don't even get me started on the, the culture identity of worshiping black women as though having, you know, a vagina and having dark skin somehow makes you some super powerful woman. Um, I don't understand why anyone should be worshiping anyone for their genitals or their color. I've never once asked someone to say, Hey, look at me. I'm a white man. <laughs> no person to person, please. Yes. And really, yeah, you're right. It's a savior complex. It's this very weird inferiority that we see coming out of a lot of this social unrest. Some of this stuff I, I remember also being shocked by, I don't know if shocked is the right word anymore, but went uh, with, with uh, the confirmation of, of Amy Coney Barrett, um, who, who, you know, among the other issues of, of maybe the controversy of that going on is they suggested that, you know, her adopting children of another race was somehow like colonialist. Um, and uh, I would imagine that her children felt very loved and <laughs> in that, in that way, it's, it must be psychologically, they talk about psychologically damaging. It must be psychologically damaging if you see that stuff said about your parents. I mean, uh, in, in a way, I don't know if I would say that it's probably psychologically damaging for, for them. I'm sure that it pissed them off and, and rightly so. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that it had, look, I, I'm not going to claim any inside knowledge of, of a fellow Hoosier, Amy Coney Barrett, yeah. uh, but I will say that, that she did brief her family on, on what was coming and that when all of these undue and, and sickening criticisms came forward from a bunch of people that boil value down to skin color, I think her family was, was prepared for it. I mean, it, it's amazing to see the arguments that are twisted and used on other individuals. I just, the double standard is really hard to hold now because of the internet and because that everything is recorded. Yeah. And when some of this stuff comes to light and yeah, people realize that you are a major hypocrite. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing such a major shift against critical race theory in the left, because it's full of hypocrisy. Okay. So when I, when I was looking into uh, CRT a little bit, um, I, I, what I was gathering is that they put an emphasis on outcomes, not necessarily, this is what they say, on one's individual beliefs and whether the person is a racist per se, but they want to examine why people are in these circumstances and how their outcomes come up, come about based on how society and, and power structures are built. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and if you look at, like, I, I, you know, I try to look at their arguments about, about redlining and all these historical injustices. Mm. Right. So in, in, how, how does that boil down in your, in your view? Like, what is wrong with saying uh, there have been all these, uh, you know, horrific things done? What are the little things that we can do to, to fix this? Because I think, I, 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 like, I think back to um, uh, The Righteous Mind that, that Jonathan Haidt wrote mm. about how basically kind of everybody has a moral, moral framework from which they work from and they all, everyone thinks they're doing good. Like, I don't know if, if people seek out to say like, let's destroy white kids necessarily right. or black kids or whatever. Um, so I think it's interesting how, how, how that comes into play. So to, to kind of begin, I would suggest that they're no longer using the terminology outcomes in general. There's actually an adjective that comes before it now and it's perceived outcomes. And if you look at the graphs of the Racial Equity Institute, for example, they will show you graph upon graph upon graph of perceived outcomes. Was it good or was it bad? Did you feel, did you feel discriminated against or was it a pretty pleasant experience? Mm -hmm. And I was, I was amazed. They showed a graph of how black people and white people felt after coming from uh, the DMV. And they were like, see, all these black people said they had a bad experience at the DMV. That means the DMV is racist. And I'm like, first of all, who is out here having positive experiences at the DMV? Uh, I'd like to meet them and ask them what they're on so that I can have a little of it the next time I have to go stand in line at the DMV. Yeah. And I, you have to kind of include perceived outcomes because you can only make an outcome-based argument so much. And here's why. Let's say there's a black family that grew up in a redlining district or a district that was originally, you know, set up, they grew up in, you know, as many different groups call it, they would call it the ghetto, they'd call it the hood, and they get out of that area. And now they're living in a middle class community in, let's say, rural Midwestern towns, and their lives dramatically improve financially, the cost of living is a little bit down, they're working in a middle class job. Many would say that the outcome when they moved to a more predominantly conservative area ended up more beneficial to their family. And so therefore the outcome suggests that moving to more conservative areas benefits you. But they would say, no, 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 no. It's actually perceived outcomes because when they move out there, they, they say people are really racist to us and they don't want us here. Is there any data or evidence to suggest that no one wants them there? Are there any crosses being burned in the front yard? Are there any angry letters, bricks thrown through windows? No, no one cares that they're there. They're just another family that's moved in. Their kids are nice. They're nice, you know? see them, we wave when we see each other going to the mailbox, that's it. You have to include perceived outcomes now because even the outcomes themselves will benefit the idea of individualism and the progress this country has made towards the civil rights movement, which the conservatives are still carrying. The idea of individualism, liberty, that your character is what counts, not your color. And so a lot of these graphs are silly and garbage. We have to like land on a few of these old Jim Crowism generational arguments because that's all they have left. They have to talk about redlining because it's not going on anymore. I mean, despite a few conspiracy theories that I've seen that are wildly inaccurate, um, they have to say that redlining is going on because technically you can draw lines generationally that people who were affected from redlining back in the 50s and 60s, their kids are still feeling that today. Well, yeah, I mean, that's how general, that's how generational poverty works. That's not systemic racism. The policy was dismantled. But just because you dismantle a policy doesn't mean it's going to be fixed tomorrow. That's not how policies work. And so over the next generation, we're going to see uh, a lot of those things alleviated by and large. But of course, only one side is going to be reporting on that. Right. Um, I, it reminds me of a, a Condoleezza Rice was on the on the view um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of crapping on on this whole thing. And, and I saw an article that called her a, a soldier of, of white supremacy. Right. <laughs> You can't. So, so uh, black people on the left can't be racist, uh, but they can be upholders of white supremacy. They can be little uncle Tom's. They can be the C word. They can be et cetera. And if a black person agrees with you, then that's fine. But if a black person disagrees with you, then they're upholding white supremacy. Gotcha. I, yeah. Again, a lot of problems could be alleviated if you just viewed someone as an individual, as a person that you agree with or you disagree with someone that's saying good things or someone that's saying trash. But they've wedged themselves into so many intersectional corners that they're calling black people white supremacists now. I mean, yeah. they were calling Jewish people supremacists in 2015 and 2016 with Ben Shapiro. So, I mean, yeah. this yeah. is just par for the course. Yeah, uh, especially when white supremacy in itself is probably anti-Semitic.
Right. Um, oh, aggressively so. I've received the DMs that call me a Jew lover. So I would say, yeah, they're very anti-Semitic. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's insane. I, I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that really got me interested in this topic um, was reading back to uh, Thomas Sowell, um, mm. uh, Inside American Education. That book was written in, in the 90s. Um, and he talks about desensitizing um, young people um, to things like making them uh, kind of write their own like eulogies. And uh, he talks about moral and cultural relativism and deliberate efforts to remove parents out of the equation. Um, I, I think you shared something uh, on your Twitter regarding um, bringing students to uh, like a gay bar um, and, yeah. uh, and also the uh, drag um, going on uh, where they're dancing on, on teachers. So, and, and this is also going on in, in Virginia um, where, where there's a huge governor race coming up. Um, Absolutely, I actually just had a piece today from the Daily Caller about it. Yes. So, so uh, I'll have to check that out. So what, yeah, what I just those, broke. Oh, awesome. What do those efforts look like to keep parents out? Because it seems like it's been going on for a long time. Um, and, and, and it's intentional. So the first thing that I would say is that in every argument, in every broad cultural argument, there is a hint of narrative truth. And this is something that's very hard to stomach. So when we're talking about free markets and, uh, we're talking about free markets versus totalitarianism versus Marxism. There are individuals out there who are being oppressed and, you know, getting the raw end of the stick by a large group that's messing with them unfairly, that is sneaking around the law, doing whatever it is. Does that mean the entire system needs to become totalitarianism and Marxist? Absolutely not. It means we need to keep a sharper eye out for those people manipulating the little guy. I would say the same thing in regards to the teacher parent conversation. So the left-wing large-scale union arm suggests that parents are no longer effective in raising their kids. There's too much fundamental religious ideas, too much racism, and basically too much individual freedom that they're going to decide what their kids do. They find that terrifying because they don't want any power ripped away from them. Academic entitlement is enormous. Oh my gosh, try calling someone who has a PhD, Mr. or Miss, and, and watch the fireworks. The entitlement in the, I mean, you see, you know, master plumbers. And I mean, a master is in like, they are officially in the union, a master plumber. They're not going to ask you, oh, it's not Mr. It's master. I mean, that, that kind of entitlement only exists in academia. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's thick, it's prevalent in education. So the reason that this comes to odds with parents, there are some crappy parents. I'll say it. There are. I, I dealt with parents when I was a teacher that were awful. They didn't care about their kids. They were horrible. They didn't get back to me. They were, what they were doing to their kids was baseline child abuse. And they would make decisions for their children that I knew were going to ruin them for life. Absolutely. Now, did the parents still have rights? Yes. Did those parents' rights still supersede mine? Absolutely. Were bad parents like that the majority of parents I worked with? Absolutely not. As I just put in a Twitter video, the majority of parents that I've worked with were awesome, very, very invested in their kids. I do think right now, and this is my biggest criticism to parents right now from Gen X and early millennials, they did not care what their kids were learning in the classroom because they didn't have to, because a lot of this kind of ran by itself. Then COVID-19 hit, they were locked in the same room as their kids and found out, oh, hey, what I am hearing is not good. And so they finally decided to get involved in their kids' education, which is we're seeing kind of whiplash on both sides. That's why it's so sparky and fiery right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of education individuals are embarrassed because the stuff that they're panhandling to children is drivel. And a lot of parents are embarrassed because they didn't actually start caring about what their kids were learning until now. And so they're, they're very angry because their kids are coming home saying socialist and like you've said, sexually explicit garbage. And the parents don't know where it's coming from and it's shocking to them. So what does this mean in regards to like, how are they accomplishing and how are they ripping away stuff from parents? Like, what does this mean for us? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say it's a net good that parents are getting involved and parents are taking their rights. What, you know, Glenn Youngkin is, is focusing on in Virginia is working. People want to be told that their rights are going to be protected. Uh, the family is an American institution. That's a fact. And to take that institution down firmly is going to be a major crime against all cultures, all colors, all peoples. And Americans are going to fight that every step of the way. As for educators, as for teachers, the majority, the vast majority of us are not anti-parent, but we don't want to tell your child what to do and, and what to learn. And when I say what to learn, I mean, 
like moral aspects of life. Uh, I want to reinforce what's going on in the home and, and many other teachers do. Um, I would say that that is made harder sometimes by the leftist union, which claims that it speaks for me and by parents who will come up to me and say, well, you're in the public schools. You're teaching my kids socialism. Mm -hmm. No, it's not true. It's more likely that your kid learned about sexual debauchery and socialism from Snapchat and the news page on Snapchat rather than in my classroom where we yesterday just talked about chemical reactions. But yeah, I mean, don't take kids to a gay bar. Don't, you know, have, don't let high school kids come to school in lingerie and lap dance on the teachers. This is very common stuff. And I mean, yeah, parents should be mad about that. I mean, that's just a totally separate thing. I mean, just like when you're mad and you find out that a parent has been abusing a kid in a home and everyone's universally mad at that. Yeah. You can be universally mad at this fire. Those teachers shut that school down with brand new leadership. It failed. Yes. Um, I, I think this, this whole movement um, kind of came about when I was leaving college. Um, there were these, these sit-ins started um, de- making just outrageous um, demands of, of teachers. And it's, it's just really interesting how that has, it just, it just felt like it suddenly happened. Like it just suddenly exploded with, with young people um, being outright socialists. I don't know if I disagree. I don't know if I agree with you there. And here, right. here would be why. There was a lot of this going on when I was in school, but technology really wasn't there yet to provide instantaneous information to children. Universities have been pumping out this filth for like three decades now, right. three decades, just very openly. Mm-hmm. I've looked at some of the teaching curriculum from like Indiana University in the late 90s, and it's just as bad as it is today. It's got the same garbage, the same filth. I mean, Gloria Ladson Billings was publishing some of her absolutely horrific stuff in the late 90s about why critical race theory should be in K through 12 classrooms. I would say that by giving every kid a smartphone, And then every kid being pretty proficient with them and the tools and materials targeted specifically towards children being very widely available. Yeah, that's caused a lot of this because social media has made being part of a movement, being part of something exciting and fun and and powerful and just a click away. And it's very easy to get a hold of. And it provides community where there is very, very rarely any community to be a part of. Right. And, and in the case of in the case of uh, Virginia, right, going on with, with the books in the libraries depicting, you know, pornographic materials. Right. Um, I is, is there re- how is there a divide over this between between parents? Like, I feel like this is something that any parent would see and be like straight or gay, whatever is depicted. This is not something that we want to have for kids to, to read. Oh, so this is actually a pretty easy one. Uh, most parents have not read the book. Most parents have not seen the images, really. Um, the, the second part of it is that there are a lot of people who just don't want to admit that they were wrong, um, that when new information comes out, you can say, oh, yeah, my gut reaction was wrong. You're correct. This is absolutely horrible. A, a book that glorifies Plato um, holding the penis of a young child is probably disgusting and especially glorifying it in, in full imagery and maybe shouldn't be in our school library if you want to put it in the public library and restrict it behind 18 uh, i mean okay again that's child pornography whether it's drawn or whether it's full photography i agree i don't know why that's a thing but i do know why it's it's being defended so strongly and that's the lgbtq movement Mm -hmm. it's there is such a a horrified terror struck idea within a lot of these communities that are very mentally unstable. So people dealing with transgenderism are by every metric of data that we have mentally unstable. And that is not an insult. That's not dehumanizing. That is someone who needs medical treatment and needs love and care. And they need to be restored to a proper physical condition. No, not through shock therapy, but through lots of counseling, through a nutritional examination, exercise regimen, and a lot of therapy and counseling. But, you know, those very massive groups of individuals are terrified at the idea that the sexual promiscuity and freedom to go out and have sex with whatever you want, who, whatever, you know, whoever you want at whatever age they are is going to be threatened. Any time that a person that has LGBTQ 2IA plus stapled to their name is threatened, the entire community rears its, you know, rears back and bears its teeth and snarls because 
They're terrified that someone is going to tell them that they don't have ultimate freedom to infringe on anyone's rights that they wish. And they have a deep despising hatred for Western culture. They have a deep despising hatred for Christian traditionalism, Jewish traditionalism, Muslim traditionalism, and they absolutely cannot stand any idea of self-control. And so they pervasively attack this stuff because the truth, the truth of the matter is any person who is part of any kind of minority group wants there to be more people. So they're not as much of a minority. That's the unspoken truth. If you are part of a minority in any area, you think, man, I wish there were more people like me around. That is the most basic truth around. And the, the keystone to this, by the way, in, in any system, if you're part of a majority, like say, oh, well, you're a white man. How can you say that? I walk into my Baptist church on Sunday and hear people say, man, I really wish there were more Baptists in this church. I wish there were more Baptist people in this town. Everyone who is a part of a minority in an area wants to be part of a larger group. And so the LGBTQ community, which is a very small portion of the country, wants there to be more LGBTQ people. That's why the recruitment for young people is so high. That's why they spend so much time talking to junior hires and high schoolers. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I'm not the person who is per putting these ideas forward. A lot of trans activists are very open and, and very forthcoming. They want these books in schools so that elementary students can be exposed to the very weird kinds of sexual acts before they hit puberty. Because once you're exposed to this stuff, there's a very high chance that you will start puberty. Your body responds to sexual phenomena very early on if that is present. That's why children have to be protected. It's very unhealthy to go through puberty early. Yeah, and I think Abigail Schreier has written quite a bit about this um, in her book, Irreversible Damage. The other, the other book that's really good on this is um, uh, the name of the title, but by, De by Deborah So, The End of Gender, um, mm. where, where she talks about this. But I, I think regardless of, of where anyone falls on, on, the, on the trans opinion, um, you know, when you're, when you're from the ages zero to 18, um, you, you likely don't have really a good grasp of your own identity. I mean, there's no likely you, you don't, your brain is developing so fast. You do not have any grasp on who you are. I mean, four-year-olds running around saying I'm a dinosaur. No, you're not a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I did that to try to get a dog when I was a kid. <laughs> did it work? Yeah, it did. It did. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully I was not raised as a German shepherd, but it, it did work. Uh, <laughs> but uh the the uh the other the other thing going around is is the 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 bills right uh the backlash to some of this in in, in some more conservative leaning states is to to ban uh crt um and the aclu is is bringing up a lawsuit um and according to the aclu school districts in the state have told teachers that they can't use terms like diversity white privilege um and books like to kill a mockingbird and a raisin in the sun um, which, which I've read both, um, should be removed from, from, from reading lists. Is, is there any truth to that? I didn't look at the bill specifically, but. What so I, uh, so I, I always, I always temper and test this stuff in, in this way. Have you heard about it in national media? Has CNN reported on the school that's banning to kill a mockingbird? I try not to watch the news. <laughs> okay. So, well, my, my point is this, no. it, it, if, if you have not heard about the school, so it's, it's no secret that, that leftist media will take a point that benefits their side and they will drive it into the dirt. Yeah. There are very, very, very few things that would damage that would damage, you know, talking points conservatives have that are left alone. And just they allow them to gently rise to a court case, which is usually what happens on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. I have not yet heard of any school that is saying, you know what, the state banned critical race theory. So we're banning to kill a mockingbird. No. And also diversity. Also, no. Now, white privilege. Well, yeah, that's a discriminatory term. You know, I, there, if I walked in and I told all of my students, hey, you're black. And so therefore you must be this, this and this. Yeah, that's discriminatory under Title VI. It's harassment under Title VII. It's, it's really, really, really bad. Um, and I can understand those terms being banned. I do think, though, that the majority of Republican governments that are banning critical race theory through state legislature are doing a terrible, terrible thing here. And here's why. Republicans and state legislatures have no idea what they're talking about in education. It's embarrassing. Uh, I have been in meetings where I have been talking to Republican lawmakers at the local, at the state, and at the national level who I've been talking to about education issues. And I have heard them refer to standards as in academic standards, as how many light bulbs there need to be in a building in order for it to be up to code. That's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. 
-hmm. Conservatives need to know education. They need to know the theories. They need to know the buzzwords. They need to know the difference between curriculum and pedagogy. You cannot ban critical race theory as a curriculum because it's not a curriculum. It's a lens. Lens makes it a pedagogy. A pedagogy is how you teach what you have. Curriculum is what you have. Pedagogy is how you're teaching it. Mm -hmm. That's what critical race theory is. It's how you teach the history, how you bend it, how you manipulate it, how you tell kids to look at it, how you tell a kid to say, mm, I don't know about that. Right. So and so these bills that are going through aren't addressing the problem. But at the same time, you're also doing a terrible thing, which is that you're giving when the next person gets into office after you, you're giving them a bat. Any curriculum you don't like can now be banned. You just have to attach the right social and outrage words to it. Mm -hmm. I think that white privilege is fine for being banned from use in pedagogical and curriculum settings because it's racist and because above all, it is a violation of Title VI, Title VII, and the anti-discrimination clauses in our country. Diversity and equity, no. I think you can mention them. That's fine. I would be much more comfortable with parents having a choice to pull their kids out of school. But I think the best approach is actually the Goldwater Institute's approach, which is making uh, curriculum, making lesson plans, making whatever it is you're doing in class transparent, as in I just have to have it posted online what it is that I'm teaching today. Yeah, well, the, the, the issue with that is, is that the government has a monopoly on it's, it's like, you know, with healthcare, they don't have to tell you how much something costs, because, you know, it, they, they have a monopoly on education, unless you can, have, unless you win a lottery for, for a charter school, or you have the money to, to pay for private school. So all the more reason to tear that down, they have no incentive to publish these things. And, mm -hmm. and actually, Absolutely. You know, they don't want to do restaurant that. fails, it shuts down us. a public school fails, and it gets more money. Yeah, exactly. Um, and do you have an example of, of, let's say, like how they might bend certain aspects of history? Um, because I mean, we look at we look at I remember learning about about slavery, about the Holocaust. Um, and and it, it's, it's terrifying. I can't imagine being a young person learning about that and, and making the association of how could I fit in here, or, or, or maybe being a, like a black kid and saying like, wow, my people, this is this is done to me based on my skin color. So how is, how is it being twisted um, exactly? Best example I have is, is uh, indigenous people and, and, and Native Americans and how we, we tell our students about them today as opposed to how we talked about them 10 years ago. So I am a very large portion Cherokee. Now, I do not mean Cherokee in the way that a white girl on Instagram says, yeah, I'm like 118th Cherokee. So we're like very, very excited about it. So no, if you look at my dad, you look at my grandfather, they're very <laughs> Cherokee looking people. <laughs> And um, within that, I do not spend all of my time, you know, claiming I have a right to talk about indigenous issues, but I do think that this one is rather interesting to consider. There is a modern way to talk about indigenous people that a lot of individuals, so in Indianapolis Public School, a lot of the racial equity team will start with this, Glory Ladson Billings and everyone from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison will start with this. They'll start with these land apologies. And their acknowledgments, they'll say, we acknowledge that we are standing on stolen native land mm -hmm. and that before we came along, it was peaceful coexistence. It was wonderful. Before we took this land from the Ho-Chunk Native Americans in Madison, it was wonderful. It was a paradise before white people came. And that's what we tell our students. That's what we tell them. Mm -hmm. The Ho-Chunk tribe raped children. Mm -hmm. Objectively, that's the fact. They would. It was a game. It was a game with a rudimentary point system to go and rape children. That was part of their culture. That was part of their society. Right. The Mayans sacrificed babies on stone altars. Right. They did. Indigenous peoples warred, battled, slaughtered. Pioneers, other tribes, whatever. There were Native American cultures in which if you, in which if a girl resisted too much, or excuse me, if a girl did not resist enough during a rape, they would give her a scar along her nose. Now, for there to be a rule that when a girl is raped, she, if she doesn't resist, or if she doesn't resist enough, she put a scar on her nose. The, the idea that rape is just so commonplace, there's a rule about it. Like when rape happens, if she doesn't resist enough, so it's enough fun for the guy, then you give her a scar on the nose. That's horrible. Backwards. People in and of themselves, every human by nature is a dirtbag. You, from the time you were born, no one had to teach you to lie, to steal, to do disgusting things. No one had to teach you to be a bad person. 
as Jordan Peterson says, within every individual is the capability to be a terrible, terrible Nazi. It is. It's the truth. It's why we have to spend so much time educating children and raising up good moral peoples and encouraging families to raise up good, strong, moral children to prevent ourselves from becoming this. So in schools, we're no longer teaching people that, you know what? Yeah, pioneers did terrible things. The U.S. Cavalry after the Civil War did terrible things. Native American tribes did terrible things. Yep. No, now we're treating as though we massacred children and angels and innocents, and it wasn't the natural progression of human civilizations warring upon each other when they come into contact for the first time, which is literally the theme of humanity. Right. I mean, Genghis Khan literally murdered and raped. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there's like a ton of descendants of him because of how prolifically he raped. Part of the African slave trade came from taking individual peoples who, or excuse me, indigenous peoples who came into contact with each other, like had these long blood feud lines, came into contact with white people first, and then said, hey, we know of a group of people that you should take from, mm-hmm. and then gave those people up to be slaves. Yes. It's, no. it's the exact same stuff. Now, does this mean that that the atrocities were committed should be treated with exceptional flippancy or that we should address that things were terrible. No, but proving that some groups are more righteous than others is absolutely silly. Yep. Um, one of the other things that I've, I've seen is, is what's called, I think, culturally relevant teaching um, mm-hmm. where like they, they, they suggest that race um, is inseparably tied with how one learns Um can you speak? Am I getting that right? Like, uh... yeah. Um, so, culturally relevant teaching, culturally responsive teaching, culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally responsive pedagogy. This is Gloria Ladson Billig's bread and butter. It's the idea that based on my students' culture, I should teach things in a slightly different way. Is is how it sounds. So, I actually kind of agree with that. Uh, I am not going to go to the hills of West Virginia in a very poor area and use examples in my math problems about lacrosse. Those kids have never heard about lacrosse. I've never played lacrosse. I don't know any of the rules. It's a rich person's game for me. I don't know anything about lacrosse or croquet or any of the other super high society sports. I don't. My teacher probably isn't going to connect to me if I, if I utilize those examples. Um, that said, well, the way it's being used is suggesting there are certain things that that black kids will learn with. And there are certain things that white kids will learn with. And so you need to have like these black strategies and you need to have these white strategies and make sure your teaching is not too white. You have this implicit bias. that means that you teach white and black kids could never understand what white kids are. That's just racist garbage. Mm -hmm. Culturally relevant pedagogy is another term that sounds nice, that in a limited way has some application and works. However, when you start applying critical race theory to the principles, to the practices, it actually becomes a, a method of saying, black people are like this. White people are like this. Therefore, if you're white, you shouldn't be teaching black people, which by the way, is what even a lot of school choice, uh, school choice people on the left, like Chris Stewart, they'll say that drivel and garbage because you know, even though they believe in school choice, they still don't want white people teaching black people or vice versa. Yep. Um, just want to wrap up here and, and just say this is this has been an awesome conversation. Where um, where can parents get involved? How can people help out? Um, any social media that that people can follow you with? What what can what can people do? Uh, absolutely, and I really appreciate hopping on here. Uh, I would say that there are a lot of fantastic networks to get involved in. Obviously, you should head over to the chalkboardreview.com. You should see what a lot of teachers, a lot of parents, a lot of industry leaders are writing. You can check out also our Teachers Lounge podcast, which is where we bring in a lot of teachers and leaders, parents, and people, and we actually ask them real questions. Uh, we don't just sit there and ask for the three Fox News or CNN bullet points and then say, hey, thanks for hopping on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say you could follow me over at Twitter at The Tonus. That's where you can follow a lot of what I'm doing. Follow Chalkboard Review at Chalkboard Rev. We're on Facebook and Instagram as well. One thing we do is we'll link you to a lot of other resources like Parents Defending Education, Purple for Parents, a lot of groups across the country that you should be checking out. We'll link a lot of local think tanks like the Idaho Freedom Foundation, et cetera. And that gets you the information that you need. And so we hope to see you there. Really appreciate uh, you having me on. And uh, we look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. All right. Thanks for joining Opposing Points, Tony. Appreciate it.